Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the course on economic methods for statisticians, data scientists and data engineers. This is the first lecture of the course and the title of this lecture is Introduction to Econometrics. Now before starting this course, let me introduce myself. My name is Anup Chaturvedi. I got superannuated from the Department of Statistics, University of Allahabad in 2019 as professor. Then the next question arises, why econometrics? Why we need this course or why we need econometrics? All of you must be having the idea that in 2019, India targeted to achieve 5 trillion US dollar economy by 2024-2025. Now, how can you do it? You cannot achieve the target if you move just in haphazard way. So you require proper planning, you require proper road map. Then how to do proper planning? The first step obviously is to identify the causal factors, the factors which can accelerate your economy. The factors such as uh, in your infrastructure, say electricity or road infrastructure, how the big cities are connected with small towns by road or railways or even digital infrastructure. And then industrialization is also responsible for economic growth, how much the agriculture sector can contribute. So these are various factors. Do you require some tax reforms, ease to do business? So you must identify all such factors which can contribute in the growth of your economy. But uh, just identifying all such factors will not work. You require certain measures. How much these factors, these variables are contributing? So, for that purpose, you require some econometric techniques. Now, suppose uh, there are some uh, unforeseen events like uh, COVID or like Ukraine war, then you would li also like to get the answer to questions like uh, how these unforeseen events are going to affect your target. Do your targets require some revision? Can you still achieve your target by 2024-2025? And uh, if you require to revise your targets, then uh, can you achieve it by 2026-2027? Or still if you want to achieve your target by 2024-2025, then how to accelerate different factors, how to do reforms in different sectors. To answer such kind of questions, again you require the help of econometrics. So in this course, I am going to discuss uh, various aspects, various models of econometrics, how to develop model, how to estimate models. If you want to use the model for prediction purpose, then how to make the predictions 
or if your objective is to test some economic hypothesis, some kind of hypothesis, then how can you develop test for those hypotheses, etc. So, that is the main objective of this course. Now, the first question arises, what is econometrics? So, econometrics may be defined as the application of statistical and mathematical methods to the analysis of economic data. In fact, econometrics provides certain measures to economic theory. So, and for the, those measures, you require application of different statistical and mathematical methods. Then it also aims to give empirical content to economic relations for testing economic theories or for forecasting or for decision making and policy evaluation. So, these are the aims of econometrics. So, you have some economic theory and you want to provide some kind of empirical content to the economic theory or the economic relations, some kind of measures to economic theory. And your objective may be to test the economic theory, whether the economic theory is valid or not, or you want to forecast some of the targeted variables. So, for forecasting purposes also, you can use different econometric models or for decision making, how much you can adjust a particular variable to achieve your target, how much more investment in uh, say some infrastructure sector like uh, road construction is required to achieve your target or the, what kind of tax reforms are required to achieve your targets. To make all such kind of decisions, we require econometrics or policy evaluation also. So, suppose you have implemented some policy changes, then after the certain period, maybe after one year or after two years, you want to evaluate whether that policy change has some positive effect or not or it has no effect or it has some negative effect. So, for that purpose also you require the econometric models. Now, you may consider econometrics as a combination of economic theory, mathematical economics and statistics. For example, we consider this microeconomic theory say demand of a commodity is expected to increase as the price of that commodity decreases. Of course, provided the other things remain constant. So, this is a particular theory. Demand in increases as price decreases or demand decreases as price increases. Then, of course, this theory gives an inverse relationship between demand and price, but it does not tell you how much demand will go up or down as a result of certain change in the price of the commodity. So, if there is a 10 percent change in price, 10 percent increase in price, how much the demand will go down you do not get answer to such kind of questions unless you provide certain measures or unless you provide some empirical content to this theory, some kind of model for this theory. So, this is the job of econometrician. Econometrician's job is to provide empirical content to the economic theory. Now, these are different topics of uh, economics, mathematical economics, economic statistics and then we come to econometrics. Then what we do in mathematical economics? You have some economic theory. So, we start from economic theory 
and then in mathematical economics we try to express economic theory in mathematical form. We try to find out some mathematical function expressing the relationship between say demand and price. So, it is a mathematical description of relationship between different economic variables. You call it causes and effects. Price is the cause and demand is its effect, describing the behavior of an economy and this is called economic model. You have some economic theory stating the relationship between certain economic variables. Some variables are causing the changes in some other variables. Then the job of mathematical economist is to develop some kind of mathematical relationship between different economic variables, which describes the behavior of the economy and this kind of model is called economic model. Then objective of the econometrician is to put economic model in such a form that allows empirical testing and empirical verification of economic theory. Now, this model is a mathematical model. Now, in practice you have to answer so many questions for this model. Say, sometimes you may have to estimate certain unknown quantities, certain unknown parameters of the model or sometimes you require empirical testing. You want to test whether this economic theory is valid or not. Then for that purpose, we write this economic model in some statistical form which allows empirical testing and empirical verification of economic theory. So, this is the job of econometrician. Then economic statistics. Economic statistics is mainly concerned with the collection, processing and presentation of economic data. So, how to collect data or how to process the data, the data may require certain transformations or how to present data using different charts or diagrams or tables etcetera. So, all these things are included in economic statistics. Then how econometric analysis proceeds? So, the main steps involved in econometric analysis is, are the statement of economic theory or hypothesis. So, this is the job of economist, he gives some economic theory or some economic hypothesis. Then in mathematical economics, specification of mathematical model. So, on the basis of this economic theory, we specify some mathematical model. Then specification of a statistical or econometric model. So, usually the economic relationships are not exact. So, you cannot say that your economic data exactly follows some mathematical model, because mathematical relationships are exact. Further, if you are using mathematical model, it would not be possible for you to estimate certain unknown parameters of the model or it would not be possible for you to test certain hypothesis whether your economic theory is valid or not or suppose you have two or three alternative models given by two or three different economists, then you cannot check which of the model is best. So, you do not have any model selection procedure. So, that is why we 
specify some statistical or econometric model. We include some stochastic component in the model to make it econometric model. Then collection of data on relevant variables. So, this is where economic statistics comes into picture, collection of data on relevant variables. Then estimation of parameters of chosen econometric model. So, you want to estimate the parameters of the model and sometimes you have to test certain hypothesis derived from the model and then your objective may be forecasting or prediction. For this purpose, for the statement of economic theory, you require some economic theory. Then for specification of mathematical model, you require mathematical economics. Then for specification of statistical or econometric model, you require some knowledge of econometrics. For collection of data, you require economic statistics and then for these three purposes, you require tools of mathematical statistics. We employ different tools of different estimation tools or different testing of hypothesis tools for these purposes. So, in fact, Econometrics is a integration of economic theory, mathematical economics, economic statistics and of course, mathematical statistics. Now, let us consider this example. So, a statement of economic theory or hypothesis. We consider law of demand, Say so, law of demand states that as the price of a commodity increases, the demand decreases, provided the other things held constant. Now, your first objective is specification of mathematical model. Now, this economic theory states that an inverse relationship exists between the price and demand. Now, it does not tell the precise form of the relationship and then to write this economic theory in precise form, we must express the statement in mathematical form. Now, suppose Q is the quantity demanded and P is the price. Now, you can uh, form different relationships expressing Q and P. Say you may write q equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 p and since the relationship is inverse, you take beta 2 less than 0. So, as price increases, quantity demanded decreases or you can take q equal to a p to the power beta and you take beta less than 0. So, again the relationship is inverse relationship as p increases q decreases or you may think of some other relationships also. Say for example, one may consider q equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 into 1 upon p and beta 2 is greater than 0. Again there is an inverse relationship between price and quantity demanded. So, in all these relationships, Q has an inverse relationship with P. Now, the problem with economic theory is that it does not provide much information about the functional form of the relationship, whether you should choose this relationship or you should go for this relationship or this relationship or any other relationship. And then for that purpose, we require some statistical tools. How to select one of these models? How to select one of these relationships? For that purpose, you require some statistical techniques, some statistical tools. Now, the next step is specification of statistical or econometric model. 
the economic relationships are usually stochastic in nature and uh, there are variables other than main dominant variable p affecting q. But uh, the model which we have developed in mathematical form was exact models. So, those models do not have any stochastic component and uh, the reason for such stochastic components may be there might be some other variables which are affecting q or your relationship may not be exact, there might be some errors in specifying the model and there are so many factors which you cannot control. So, that is why the relationships are not exact in nature. So, what we do say suppose u is some random variable and it includes the effect of all other variables or all other such misspecifications in the relationships. Then we can write the model as q equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 p plus u. So, we have added this random variable here. Still we are taking beta 2 less than 0. This u is called the random error term or it is also called the disturbance term. Now, this particular equation is an statistical model or econometric model or suppose you consider this relationship q equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 1 upon p. Then here also you can add this random variable u say. Then this relationship becomes stochastic. So, this is a statistical model or econometric model. Now, econometrics models may have more than one equations. Just for example, suppose you have this wage equation. We assume that say w is the rate of change in money wage and this is a function of u which is percentage unemployment rate and p, p is the rate of change in price and then we add this error term or disturbance term u 1 here and then you have a price equation p equal to say beta naught plus beta 1 w. So, this price or rate of change in prices p also depends upon rate of change in money wage plus beta 2 r, r is the rate of change in cost of capital plus beta 3 m, m is the money supply of money plus you have added this disturbance term. So, this particular econometric model which explains wage equation or wage and price. These are the two variables which are explained by this model or these two relationships. So, this particular model has two equations. So, it is not necessary that your model has just one equation, it may have more than one equations also. Actually here the objective of uh, having more than one equations is because you want to explain two variables using this model. You want to explain both wage and price using this model. For explaining money wage, you are also making use of price. For explaining price, rate of change in price, you are also making use of rate of change in money wage. Next step is collection of data on relevant variables. So, here economic statistics comes into picture. Usually there are three types of data available. First is time series data, say for a certain variable you collect data, you take observations over a period of time. This data may be yearly data, this may be monthly data or daily data or may be hourly data, but you take observations over a period of time. Say for example, 
data on an unemployment rate of a country for 10 consecutive years. So, for the particular country you have taken observations on unemployment rate for 10 consecutive years. So, you have a time series data. Then cross section data, cross section data are collected on one or more variables at a single point of time. So, here the time does not matter, the time does not have much role to play. You have a number of units, a cross section and then you take observations on one or more variables at a particular point of time. So, for example, data on unemployment rate of 20 countries at a particular time point, say in 2020 say. So, you have a cross section of 20 countries and then you have taken observation on unemployment rate. Then you have pooled out panel data pooled or panel data is a combination of time series and cross section data. So, you have a cross section of units and then for each individual or for each unit of the cross section you take observations at regular intervals. So, it is a combination of time series and cross section data. Say for example, data on unemployment rate of 20 countries for 10 consecutive years. So, you have a cross section of 20 countries and then for each country you have 10 consecutive years observations. So, for each country you have time series observations. So, such kind of data is called pooled or panel data. This is also called longitudinal data. Now, your next step is estimation of parameters. Now, law of demand states that beta 2 is less than 0 we consider the model q equal to beta 1 plus beta 2 p plus u say. And since there is inverse relationship, so according to your economic theory beta 2 is less than 0. Now, statistics provide us methods to estimate the parameters on the basis of given observations on p and Q. So, you take observations on P and Q, then you get different tools or different methods for estimating beta 1 and beta 2 in statistics. Because uh, even if the law of demand states that beta 2 is less than 0, you are not sure how much the quantity demanded changes if you decrease the price by 10 percent. Of course, you know that it is going to increase the demand, but you do not have idea how much the demand will increase for the 10 percent decrease in price. So, for that purpose you require statistical tools. Then tests of hypothesis derived from the model. So, does the estimated model supports the economic theory? So, your economic theory states that beta 2 is less than 0. Then you have taken these observations. Whether your empirical study, whether your observations support your economic theory or not. So, for that purpose you have to test this hypothesis beta 2 less than 0. Now, suppose you estimate this model, your economic theory states that beta 2 is less than 0, but 
when you estimate this model you observe that beta 2 is greater than 0. Then what are the possibilities? One possibility is that your economic theory is not valid, but there are some other possibilities also. Say you might be leaving some other important factors. Say price is affecting quantity demanded, that, but uh, there might be some other variables like wages of the people affecting the quantity demanded or there might be some substitutes for this particular product on which your uh, study is focused, but for those substitutes prices were also increased even in greater proportion say. So, the customers of those products are moving towards this product. So, even if this, this product has also increased the price, its demand has increased. So, there might be several other factors which are left in the specification of model or your economic theory might not be valid. So, you must be careful about all these things while specifying your model or while observing some such kind of contradictions. So, you must look at your economic theory as well as your econometric model again. Then one of the important objective is forecasting or prediction. So, estimated demand function can be used to predict the value of demand for the specific value of price. If you decrease the price by 10 percent, what is the predicted value of demand? So, you can use your model for the prediction purpose also. Then there are many econometric applications. It is used in business, in economics of, of course, in government planning, in policy organizations also it is widely used in banking sector, central banks or in different financial services or economic consulting firms. At all these places often you require relationship between different variables, cause and effect relationship between different variables and then you require econometric methods. Then it is also used by most profit companies for strategic planning tasks such as investment or pricing, advertising, budgeting, revenues, etcetera. Say how much you should increase the investment or advertising to increase the profit. So, for that purpose you require to use some kind of econometric modeling. So, main emphasis in econometrics is for analyzing the relationships between variables that is causal relations and prediction. So, you want to develop causal relationships between different variables and then of course, one of the main objective is prediction or forecasting. Now, econometrics and data science, why is econometrics important for data scientists? Actually, there are many common interests, there are many areas of, of common interest between machine learning people and econometricians. Say for example, both uh, in machine learning as well as in econometrics, there is great emphasis on linear regression, linear models. 
or in econometrics we use logistic regression. In machine learning also for classification purpose we use logistic regression or panel data models. We also get panel data in machine learning. In machine learning also you get data which are observed over the cross section and then you have observed it over a certain period of time. So, you get panel data. So, you can use panel data models in econometrics as well as in machine learning. Or there are several panelized regression techniques like lasso, which are used in econometrics to overcome the problem of multicollinearity. But these techniques are even more popular in machine learning or even in bioinformatics, because in machine learning also you face the curse of dimensionality, you get data of very high dimension. So, if you want to fit a linear model, then you require penalized regression techniques in machine learning also or principal component analysis. In econometrics we use principal component analysis, but in machine learning also when you get high dimensional data it is called curse of dimensionality. Then to reduce the dimension of data without losing much information you require different principal component techniques. So, all these tools are required in econometrics as well as in machine learning. Further data science focuses more on the development of optimal algorithms and obtaining higher accuracy via tuning the parameters and cross validation. So, their more focus is on developing the algorithms and if data scientists have some econometrics background also, they have some knowledge of all these tools, all these models. Then they get better idea of intuition behind machine learning models. Not only that, it is other way around also, because nowadays when you analyze data in the field of economics, you have economic data. So, in economics also you get very high frequency data, very high dimensional as well as a large data set. So, in econometrics also we require all these data sciences or all these machine learning tools, machine learning algorithms for faster calculations. So, both the fields can help each other, they can substantiate each other. Now, we define some of the terms which are used in econometrics, explanatory and response variables. An explanatory variable is the expected cause and it explains the result. A response variable is the ex expected effect and it responds to changes in explanatory variables. So, for example, in the model between quantity demanded and price.
changes in price are causing the changes in quantity demanded. So, for this particular model, price is your explanatory variable and quantity is your response variable. Quantity is responding to the changes in price. So, it is the response variable. Another example is a researcher has five brands of coffee and he believes that different brands used to make a cup of coffee affect hyperactivity differently. So, you have say five brands of coffee and a cup of each brand affects the hyperactivity in a different way. And your objective is to study how different brands of coffee are going to affect the hyperactivity. Then explanatory variable is coffee brand. These are your different input variables or explanatory variables, different brands of coffee. The response variable is hyperactivity level. So, hyperactivity levels are caused by different brands of coffee. So, different brands of coffees are also known as causal factors. Then exogenous and endogenous variables. Exogenous variables are determined outside the model and it is imposed on the model. An exogenous change is a change in an exogenous variable. And endogenous variable whose measure it is, is determined by the model. And endogenous change is a change in an endogenous variable in response to an exogenous change that is imposed upon the model. So, we have these two kinds of variables exogenous variable and endogenous variable. Usually an endogenous variable or endogenous random variable is correlated with the other term while an exogenous variable is not. So, let us take this example. Suppose uh, amount, we consider amount of wheat produced and then it may depend upon different factors such as weather variable, farmer skill, pastes, price of seeds, price of diesel etcetera. So, you may consider all these as exogenous to crop production, to wheat production. These variables are exogenous variables. Then amount of wheat produced is endogenous variable and other variables are exogenous variables. But the question is are other variables actually exogenous? So, if you consider the entire system, then you also observe that the insects depend upon weather variable. Here you have these two variables weather variable and then pastes. Then these pastes also depend upon different weather variables like temperature, rainfall etcetera. All price of seeds depend upon price of diesel. So, these two variables price of seed depends upon price of diesel also. Now, if you are not considering these two factors in the system, then it is fine you take amount of wheat produced as endogenous variable and other variables as exogenous variable, but this model may not be proper because no, you are not taking into account these factors. And if you consider the entire system, if you consider these factors also in your system, then these two variables 
are also endogenous variables. Say pastes and tries of seeds, these are endogenous variables. So, it depends how you formulate your model or how you visualize your system. If you just consider wheat produced and then other variables as uh, extraneous variables, then it is fine. But uh, if you consider the entire system and you consider these factors also, then you have uh, three endogenous variables. Now, we consider a brief outline of the course. So, in lectures 2 and 3, I will discuss the matrix methods and multivariate normal distribution, some results related to the matrix methods and multivariate normal distribution. In fact, uh, these two topics are prerequisites for this course. Of course, uh, I won't go into much details, but if you want to properly follow this course, then you must have sufficient knowledge of matrix algebra as well as multivariate techniques like multivariate normal distribution. Then in lecture 4, I will consider simple linear regression model involving just two variables and then we will discuss the method of least squares and etcetera. In lectures 5, 6 and 7, I will move to multiple linear regression model, different estimation techniques like least square procedure, method of maximum likelihood and then we will also discuss different model selection procedures. In lectures 8, 9 and 13, I will consider estimation and testing under the exact and stochastic linear restrictions. So, sometimes you have some prior information and you can express your prior information in the form of exact or stochastic linear restrictions on regression parameters. So, how to estimate those parameters, how to test the hypothesis, all those things I will discuss in these three lectures. Then in lectures 10, 11 and 12, I will move to the model with non-spherical disturbances, including the model with heteroscotastic disturbances as well as autocorrelated disturbances. Then in lecture 14, we will consider the prediction problem, prediction in models with spherical and non-spherical disturbances. In lecture 15, I will consider the specification analysis. Say often it happens that uh, you include some irrelevant variables which are not important, which should not have been there in the model or you exclude some of the important relevant variables from the and then how is it going to affect the properties of your estimators, the properties of your estimated model. All these things will be discussed in lecture 15 specification analysis. In lectures 16, 17 and 18, we will consider the models with the stochastic regressors and measurement error model. Often uh, we measure the explanatory variables uh, with some error. So, you have some kind of measurement error. So, how to estimate such kind of models or what are the implications of measurement error? All these things we will discuss in these three lectures. Then Sometimes you have some sort of structural break in the model, say model changes direction, parameters change and all such kind of tests for the structural breaks we will discuss in lecture 19. Then one of the main problem in estimation of multiple linear regression models is multicollinearity. So, in lectures 20, 21 and 22, we will discuss multicollinearity problem, how to estimate parameters when multicollinearity is present, different penalized and shrinkage estimation techniques. 
in lectures 23, 24 and 25, we will consider dummy explanatory variables, discrete dependent variables and then it also includes models like logit model, Trovit model, Tovit model and multinomial choice models. In lecture 26, we will consider distributed lag models and sometimes your relationships are not linear. For so, if the form of relationship is non-linear, then how to proceed? That I will discuss in lecture 27. In lectures 28 and 29, we will consider seemingly unrelated regression model and then we will move to simultaneous equations model. So, estimation and identification in simultaneous equations model in lectures 30 to 36. And in final four lectures from 37 to 40, we will consider panel data model. Uh, in the course, I have used uh, all these references. So, you can go through all these books during this course. So, this entire course is of 40 lectures and then the prerequisites for this course are of course, uh, you must have basic knowledge of uh, mathematical statistics like different estimation techniques, the method of maximum likelihood, method of least square etcetera. So, you must have some basic knowledge of all these tools. Then uh, in uh, econometrics, particularly in defining different econometric models or in deriving various estimators or in studying the properties of various estimators, we require matrix algebra tools. Actually, if you use matrix al algebra, then it becomes uh, very much convenient for you to express the model in a compact way and uh, also do the derivations in compact way. So, you must have good background of matrix algebra and different multivariate techniques. In particular, you must have good knowledge of multivariate normal distribution. Of course, in lectures 2 and 3, I am going to cover most of the results of matrix algebra and multivariate analysis which I will use during the course. Of course, uh, at most of the places, I will not give you the derivations of matrix algebra results. So, if you require the derivations, then you must consult some good matrix algebra book. And uh, then, uh, mainly this uh, course is concerned with econometric methods. So, I will not discuss much about the application part, but I advise you to apply all these techniques to some real data set. Try to learn some econometric software also, of course, it is not my objective during this course to teach you some econometric software. But you must try to learn some econometric software and then try to apply all these econometric methods which I am going to teach you during this course to some real data set. Then you will be able to get real flavor of all these econometric models or econometric methods. So, I am going to stop here. Thank you.
I am uh, A.K. Sharma and I am Professor of Sociology at IIT Kanpur. The question I am going to address is uh, what is urbanization? Urbanization is essentially the process of population concentration, which means that if more people start living in a smaller number of places or if the distribution of population uh, becomes more unequal like more people living in places like Bombay, Calcutta, Mexico, uh, then we say that the urbanization is taking place. Essentially, it means increase in percentage of population living in areas or localities which are defined as urban. Urbanization is a new phenomenon, of course, a post-industrial phenomenon. About 200 years ago, hardly 5 percent population of the world lived in urban areas. And today, more than 50 percent population of the world is living in urban areas or localities which are classified as urban. You will be happy to know that uh, according to 2011 census of India, in our own country for the first time, increase in the urban population has been greater than the increase in the rural population. Though India is not so urban as the developed countries and about 31 percent population of India only is living in urban areas. We can believe that uh, in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years time, India will also be more urban, at least more urban than what it is. It may not be 80 percent, but certainly it will be 35 percent or 40 percent. Now, how is this uh, urban locality defined because this definition of locality as urban or rural is crucial to major level of urbanization. I will give you definition of our own country. In Indian census, an urban locality is defined in two ways. There are statutory towns and there are census towns. All places with municipality, municipal corporation, cantonment, or notified town area committees are called urban. This is statutory definition. According to demographic definition, there are three main criteria. Uh, if a locality has more than 5000 people or 75 percent of male labor force is engaged in non-agricultural activities or the density of population is 400 per square kilometer or 1000 per square mile, then we say that the locality may be classified as urban. There are many other additions to this definition. Now, we have the concept of urban agglomeration and many other things, but essentially this is how urban population is defined in India. And as I said that urbanization is associated with economic development and industrialization, same is the case with India. Uh, about 100 years ago in India only 11 percent people were living in urban areas, today 31 percent are living in urban areas and uh, this is obviously linked with economic development of the country, growth of per capita income and industrialization. Uh, I remember that in one five year plan it was mentioned uh, uh, that uh, today you know, this urban population can grow by way of natural increase of births minus deaths in the urban areas itself or through rural to urban migration. Today, uh, nearly 60 percent contribution to growth of urban population is due to rural to urban migration and this is going to increase. This is essentially what urbanization means. Urbanization means growth of population in localities defined as urban in relation to population of localities defined as rural and uh, I have given you an Indian definition. Thank you very much.